So George, can you hear me okay? Yeah, just fine. I'm competing with Bob Reese, which is a toughie for this hour. Yeah, okay. Well, I think we're live, but I can't see the... So I'll go ahead and read the, the session script. Uh, then if you can mute and then we'll, we'll have you talk, George, okay? So thank you everyone, good morning. We got a little slow start and uh, we do have some tech, tech, technical difficulties right now. Uh, George's camera is not working. So he's, he's taught, uh, we're able to hear him okay. So we're gonna have him uh, give his presentation. He'd like to take the questions at the end of the session, so go ahead and and uh, put post those in the Q and A chat window as uh, as the presentation is going. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending 220 Sunstone Digital Symposium, session 313, titled "No Industrial Revolution, No Latter 19th Century or Later Mormonism: How a Religion Founded in America Became Largely British." The audio for this session will be available for purchase at sunstone.org after the symposium. The video recording of this session will be available in the WUVA app for the remainder of 2020. Um, as I mentioned, the Q&A will do at the end. So just answer your, uh, post your questions there. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is there's more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at Sunstone. Um, about this presentation, uh, had it had not its main body moved to the Intermountain West, the church would not have grown and prospered that way it did. In order to achieve an economically self-sustained societal critical mass in an inhospitable environment. Brigham Young, the industrialist, needed a large number of workers possessing post-agrarian vocational skills and the motivation and financial wherewithal to pick up and relocate. Uniquely able to satisfy that need was a post-industrial revolution Great Britain, which provided about three quarters of the 60,000 to 70,000 saints who had immigrated to the Salt Lake Valley by 1868. Uh, let me introduce our, our speaker. George is a descendant from Mormon pioneers, uh, pre-railroad access, um, who joined the church in England, graduated, uh, a graduate of BYU Math and Stats and UCLA Economics PhD, past symposium presentations, including the morality of suicide by dehydration, i.e. versus expensive short-term life extending medical procedures and the modern cultural case for polygamy. Uh, I'll now give the, uh, turn the time over to, uh, to George to give his presentation. Uh, if we can figure out the camera in the meantime, we'll turn that on. Uh, in, in any case, please ask your questions. George, if you can unmute and we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Brett. Uh, it may be propitious that we can't use the camera. Uh, I'm way out in the country in, in Oregon and I have very low tech uh, connection to email, internet, and I was advised that I may have to turn off the camera anyway uh, to keep from breaking up the signal. So uh, this will be as fine. Uh, Again, my name is George Compton. Uh, I'm an economist, not a historian. 
The historian is Todd Compton. Many of you know him as the author of the book In Sacred Loneliness, The Pearl Wise of Joseph Smith. <clears throat> Our great grandfather, George Compton, settled in Morgan, having walked from the then railroad terminus in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which at that, <clears throat> in his journey that began in, in England. A quick note on the bio, uh, instead of the modern cultural case for polygamy, it should have said the modern libertarian conservative case for polygamy. The dominant culture in America, of course, is liberal. And you don't see liberals, especially liberal Mormons, advocating for polygamy. Yes, there can be one, more than one way to Sunstone, even vote Republican. <laughs> now a truth in labeling confession. I found out too late that I could have edited or altered, it, altered my title. Instead of no industrial revolution, no blah, 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 Mormonism, to be academically technical, I, sh I should have said no industrial revolution or which would remain a, a demographically bereft Mormonism. Or I could have said no Mormonism as we had come to know it. Demographically bereft means that Mormonism would have been lacking uh, the, the, the quantity and quality, the caliber of citizens that actually enabled it to thrive the way it did. <clears throat> I did not mean to imply that the church would not have survived at all but without the sheer number of immigrant saints and the occupational skill set they embodied, circumstances for the church would have been much different and far from favorable. Up until 1907, when the saints were instructed to build up the church in their own countries, gathering to Zion was almost obligatory for new members of the church. Besides the theological and evangelical aspects of the gathering, there is also the political component, as in strength in numbers, to avoid again becoming a persecuted minority. But if there was to be a renewed gathering, it certainly wasn't going to come from the rest of the USA. We know that the bulk of the gathering after those from Nauvoo had made their move was from Northern Europe and particularly Great Britain. Why Great Britain? The Andrefa Revolution, which took place there. My presentation will clarify the connection between Industrial Revolution, Great Britain, and the church. <clears throat> As for a teaser, along with explaining why this 19th century church was largely British, I'll also explain why it turns out that the United States itself can truly regard, can't truly regard as British at all, despite the fact that this nation's founding fathers were almost entirely English. Only Utah, Idaho, and Maine, out of all the states, have a plurality that claims Great British, Great Britain as their ancestry, country of ancestry. 20 claim Germany and so on and so forth. Yes, English was our founding fathers, but we truly are a nation of immigrants. Now for the sentence I chanced, I sent, I chanced upon, perhaps in a second meeting talk, that motivated this session. And I'm quoting from an LDS.org related source, quote, of the 60,000 to 70,000 saints who immigrated to the Salt Lake Valley in the late 1800s, and I would say mid to late 1800s, after the relocation of the Nauvoo Saints in the early 1850s, <clears throat> more than 98% of the survivors were from Europe and 75% were from Britain." End quote. Yikes. That means less than 2% of those later arrivals came from the other US states. And a whole bunch of the rest came from Great Britain. Why Great Britain? Yes, English speaking and freedom from a, and, and having basic religion freedom with, and uh, no longer you know, captive to, a, to a, a monolithic religion. Those were the necessary conditions, but, that's, but they certainly weren't sufficient. In looking for those other conditions, perhaps my bias as an economist led me to my economic explanation that the, the, which is to say the Industrial Revolution, which took place in Great Britain, well ahead of the other, in the other countries. Before going into the hows and whys of their Industrial Revolution, <coughs> Industrial Revolution connection, I want to dispense with 
some raw population numbers. And I get these from the Utah His History Encyclopedia. From the section, British Immigrants and Life in Utah, we read, the 1870 census, which is just before the, just after the Golden Spike, nearly a quarter of Utah's inhabitants were natives of the British Isles. With their American-born children, they may, they may well have been, may well have made up as much as one half of the population, end quote. Add in the other immigrants, and that leaves American-rooted Utah Mormons at only about one third of the population at that time. In some, and focusing on 1870, Brits, including first generation children, were about one half of, and the Americans were only about one third. The remainder were mostly Scandinavians, and again, of, and of those mostly Danes. The American share continues to, continued to shrink as the 19th century progressed, as most of the convert baptisms were coming from Northern Europe. <clears throat> Now I want to talk about the area where the renewed gathering was to take place. How did it fit in with the underlying goals and objectives? Besides membership growth, there had to be a place where the members could be left alone, at least until the, until the church had grown and built itself up politically and economically to be able to withstand whatever challenges might lie ahead. They did not want to return to being another, an area's minority, which would invite a return to persecution. Obviously, the most the mostly inhospitable desert terrain of the Wasatch Front fit the bill perfectly. And a side benefit of having a desert which doesn't produce uh, plants, which which would then produce animals, if you have hunter gatherers, which was what the Native Americans were, you weren't going to have very many. So unlike the other parts of the United States, the pioneers didn't have to compete with with too many Indians, which made it a lot easier for them. But I said mostly inhospitable. The mountain precipitation could be harnessed, but it would take dams, reservoirs, canals, and irrigation ditches, which would take a major communal effort that would not be required to farm in the wet and fertile Willamette Valley of Oregon and the Central Valley in California. If you're gonna cross over the Rockies, why stop in a desert, continue on to Oregon and, and California. A side benefit of being able to grow crops behind their own needs, the ch church members were able to generate cash income by selling their produce to those who were journeying onto the west coastal areas. That economic surplus played a major role in, in funding the gathering of Zion that was a key facet to becoming a Mormon up until 1907. It wasn't until silver and other minerals were discovered that others showed any interest in the area. By then, at least as far as mining in Utah was concerned, the Mormon population had grown to where they easily outnumbered the Gentile miners who came there. The biggest push for Mormon population growth took place in the, <clears throat> in the latter 1860s in the event that the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 were to bring an unwelcome influx of Gentiles to the valley. So before it was cheap and easy to get to Utah, the intent was to have so many Mormons that they would not be in danger of being outnumbered. So that was the area that was to be settled by the members of the church. Besides the limited number of Nauvoo saints, who were those settlers to be? That takes us to the British Isles and the Industrial Revolution. Before talking about the settlers per se, let's quickly gain some understanding as to why the Industrial Revolution took place in Great Britain and why it produced a bunch of people willing to look for a new life in the Deseret and briefly lay out factors behind the Industrial Revolution taking place in Great Britain. Some people attribute the Industrial Revolution being in Great Britain to the fact that grass grows well. I live in the Willamette Valley, in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and believe me, grass grows very well here. And three of my five acres are grazed by sheep, by about 25 sheep from my neighbor. Anyway, with grass, you have sheep. With sheep, you have wool. With wool, you have textiles. So England 
already in Scotland already had something of a cottage industry in the textile business. So it only came, came natural that when it came, when the cotton uh, jenny and so forth was produced, that England would be the place where the new were, were cotton and, and the other uh, <coughs> fabrics were, were made. James Watt, uh, who uh, invented this, the basic steam engine, uh, was a Scottish uh, uh, <clears throat> inventor. Uh, iron and coal are plentiful in England. There was an entrepreneurial skill, an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, London had a history of being seafaring, seafaring traders, and they had a capital market. Uh, if you're gonna have a factory, you gotta accumulate capital, and ergo, we have uh, you know the stock, you know, primitive stock exchanges where where people could combine their money and produce factories. A key part of the industrial revolution was the agricultural revolution. Between 1700 and 1750, the population of England stayed relatively flat, but from 1750 to 1850, advances in agriculture, such as crop rotation, something as, as obvious as that you'd think. Uh, enabled its population to more than double. The ballooning population ma manned the growing factories that typified the Industrial Revolution. So, <clears throat> so now we have the first key factor of how the Industrial Revolution produced so many Brits who eventually made it to Brigham Young's kingdom. It was the cities that concentrated the populace and produced the converts, the Wilford and Wildruff, with the Wilford Woodruff and others were to bring into the church. They didn't have to traverse the countryside looking for investigators. That would have been a waste of time. People with long-standing familiar attachments to farms would be far less likely to be attracted to the new world of the Deseret than with the residents of the crowded and otherwise far from hospitable factory towns. So here again, uh, because of the Industrial Revolution, people were concentrated and made uh, readily available to, in large numbers to be visited by missionaries and attracted to the church. And the, sec and the second part of it is that where they were living wasn't, weren't necessarily that, you know, the most desirable places to live. They were crowded, uh, dirty, and so forth. But anyway, that was the product of the, the, of the revolu Industrial Revolution in England. <clears throat> but this But the cities did not just produce people looking for a new way of life in a far off land. That takes us to the second key factor of how the Industrial Revolution produced so many Brits who eventually made it to the Salt Lake Valley. Brigham Young's kingdom, and I use that term from uh, Larrington, Leonard Arrington's book, The Economic History of the Latter-day Saints, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, <clears throat> the title was uh, The Great Basin Kingdom, the economic history was from 1830 to 1900. Leonard Arnton was a church historian, also a professor of econ at, at Utah State. Anyway, <clears throat> Brigham Young's kingdom envisioned much more than farmers and farming. First, the area had only so much desert farmland and claimable water. A post-agrarian economic base needed to be developed so that large numbers of people could arrive to the valley and find employment. Quoting to quoting Leonard Darrington and referring to the organizing of the Perpetual Immigration Fund, quote, our true policy is to do our own work, make our own goods as soon as possible. Therefore, do all, we, all you can to further the immigration of artisans and mechanics of all kinds, end of quote. The, other, the urbanized and otherwise non-agrarian source of the British Mormon converts matched up nicely with this demand out of Salt Lake. Continuing to quote Arrington, the pages of, Mormon, of contemporary Mormon periodicals in Europe are replete with appeals to mechanics and artisans and manufacturers to make immediate plans to immigrate to the Salt Lake Valley. End quote. In the Deseret, the recruited workers would find employment waiting for them. Anyway, the goal of assembling a skilled labor force was achieved. And still quoting from quoting Arrington, I'm 
grabbing his book. Leaving Ember, leaving Emberpool, this is the skill set that people leaving Liverpool. Included 96 boot, boot and shoe makers, 10 boiler makers, 12 cabinet makers, 46 engineers, two iron mongers, 226 miners, 73 masons, eight printers, 22 sprinters, spinners, nine weavers, and some 300 other specialized skills and occupations. From the 1860 census, we observed that barely half of the 8,400 workers in the Utah were farmers or farm laborers, with over 100 other professions listed in that census, from dagware typists to machinists and to weavers. So we see, <clears throat> so we see that the Industrial Revolution produced an ideal pool, pool of potential additions to Utah demography, but they still needed to get there. Here again, the Industrial Revolution plays an essential role in two key respects. Our industrial revolution factor number three has to do with the cost of getting Europeans to America and onto Utah. In the age of sailing ships, crossing the Atlantic took a long time and was costly. The industrial revolution characterized by the steam engine, hence steam, steam ships and upstream stern wheelers cut the cost of crossing the Atlantic and moving up the Mississippi from New Orleans to, to the St. Louis jumping off point to maybe a fraction of what it was before, <clears throat> before being the days of sailing ships and cross country travel overland from say New York Harbor to Missouri. But even with the low cost, it, it has been a common lot almost of all mankind to barely have enough of the worldly goods to physically survive, much less pay for a transoceanic and transcontinental voyage with the spouse and children along with themselves. But here again, the Industrial Revolution, confined at first to Great Britain, came, comes to the rescue. Now for our fourth factor. In their competition for, for the laborers to man the factories, wages for the British worker came to be the highest in the world. We talk about the Perpetual Immigration Fund that subsidized moving to Utah, but the majority of the Brits played all or most of the way enabled by the greater wealth produced by the Industrial Revolution. Speaking of the Perpetual Immigration Fund, it is interesting to see exactly how much of the role it played in bringing the Saints to the Salt Lake Valley. Again, we turn to Leonard Arrington for details. There were actually three levels of immigration funding. Taking the 2,300 plus immigrants traveling under the auspices of Perpetual Immigration Agents, of the 2,300, 400, were so poor as to have all their expenses paid by the fund. 1,000 were in the 10 pound car category, which enabled a family to go to Utah for only 10 pounds per adult and five pounds per infant. And that did cover the lion's share of the travel costs. Then over 900 paid their way entirely. So the 2,300, uh, 1,900 of the 2,300 paid most or all of their way. And those who were subsidized were expected to repay back into the fund through cash, produce, or labor. But because of the varying economic circumstances, the repayment wasn't vigorously enforced. If it had been, uh, these immigrants would have been largely like the, in, in, <clears throat> like the uh, uh, servants who came to, uh, indentured servants who came to the US early on with the Brits. So now let us review the four features of the first British Industrial Revolution that were indispensable in allowing the Saints to thrive in the Rocky Mountain home, secure with the confidence that came from being able to not only triple its population via immigration, that is to say, triple its population, but having those immigrants possess critical post agrarian employment skills. They are one, the, <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution produced a growing population that was, that in turn, liberated from agriculture and concentrated in industrial towns and cities, a population that included many who were amenable to the promise of a better life as a Mormon in Utah. Two, the Industrial Revolution produced a labor force with a skill set that would enable the kingdom to thrive in a post-agrarian economic state. Three, the Industrial Revolution greatly reduced the cost of transoceanic trans and continental travel. Four, 
the British Industrial Revolution increased worker wages to the degree that workers themselves could afford to pay most, if not all, of the cost of making it to Utah. For initial context, context, it's interesting to compare and contrast the arrival of the Brits to America in the mid 1800s, early to mid 1800s, and the conditions and motivations of the Irish, of the main of the main ethnic groups who came to America in large numbers. The original settlers, as we know, <clears throat> in uh, the, the Puritans and in uh, Jamestown, were the English. They brought with them. Uh, especially in the South, Irish to do the to do do the hard work. Uh, after the the Irish uh, were not too long after sub supplanted by by the by the Africans because the Africans had resistance to malaria. Uh, but after the Africans were there, they still used the Irish for the most because they were the indentured service uh, because. <clears throat> If somebody was going to have uh, be injured, they'd rather have an indentured service who, is, who only has a, a limited, uh, you know, commitment versus uh, a black who who had the, who was going to be a, a, the lifetime uh, uh, possession. Uh, early on, where all of the Scotch Irish, uh, they came uh, later, and so they ended up on the frontiers, like uh, East, uh, Western uh, North Carolina, and on into. Uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, then came uh, uh, then came a, a big influx of Brits, and <clears throat> you have to bear in mind that from 1820 to 1870, over seven and a half million immigrants came to the United States, more than the entire population of the country in 1810, and they nearly all came from Northern and Western Europe. Uh, the big influx uh, after the Brits uh, were the Irish. And I read that uh, it was equivalent basically to half the population of, of Ireland coming to the United States. About the same number of Germans, obviously not half of Germany, but in terms of the thousands of Germans, uh, there was also a, a huge influx of Germans during the, as, as the 19th century progressed. Uh, at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century came the Italians. And then of course, uh, in the in the mid 20th century came the Mexicans. With the exception of the Germans, the British immigrants of the 19th century had it better than all the others. The others came uh, <clears throat> and that would be expected with this more advanced economy. There wasn't the same motivation uh, for the Brits to come to America in order to achieve a better standard of living. They already had about the best standard of living in the world. Now, it's interesting to see what the consequences of all those immigrants. Uh, and from there, I, I turned to uh, a U.S. Census 1970, 2017 survey just three years ago, U.S. Census Bureau, where they asked people to give their first and second choice of their nation of what they call self-identified national ancestries. Of the, of the states uh, of, uh, receiving the most votes, 21 American states gave Germany as their pr primary and of their premier ancestry. That's all of the, of the Northern Terror of, of the United States from Oregon and Washington, all the way through the Middle West, the Great Lakes, and, in the, and including Pennsylvania. The next highest number of, this, of states with, with their foreign ancestry declared were African-Americans. Uh, and there we have nine states, including Washington, D.C. That doesn't mean that the African Americans were always the majority, but the uh, national origins of the, of the whites uh, didn't, uh, were so fragmented as to make the African American 
the plurality. Now we have the, the, in, the consequence of the Irish. Five states, uh, including Massachusetts, claim Ireland as their principal ancestry source. Of course, with the Kennedys coming from, from Massachusetts, so that's not a surprise, but four other states besides Massachusetts. <clears throat> Three states, including New York State, claim Italian as their principal national origin. Only three states, Utah, Idaho, and Maine, claim England or the British Isles as a national uh, origin source. So we see that, that even though uh, the US was founded by, by the English, uh, we can really say that uh, America is a nation of immigrants. Uh, and there's only actually two, uh, two states that claimed uh, being American as their national origin. And these were tennis, and, and is it, and American is one of the choices they can make. And the two states that said American was their source were, were Kentucky and Tennessee. And, and as it turns out, the, those states were, are with the Scotch-Irish, which is the Northern Ireland uh, dominated. To, uh, to conclude, um, in the current vernacular, vernacular, uh, my pioneer heritage is an unearned privilege. Uh, as mentioned in this, in the dialogue opening prayer uh, last Sunday, which is came, came right after the. Uh, Pioneer Day, the, the the person giving the prayer gave, you know, expressed gratitude for the bravery and, and so on of his pioneer ancestry or of the pioneer uh, legacy of the church uh, in Utah. Uh, I would say that, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is, we are privileged and the, the challenge, uh, is for us to, you know, deploy that privilege to, you know, in, indeed helping lift others' burdens and helping to, helping in the healing process. And so <clears throat> that would be my concluding comment. We have a, we have a, it's, uh, I'm, I don't expect Utah to ever s not celebrate the 24th as, a, as a, a celebratory event. And because we do have, uh, <clears throat> we have much to be happy for. Uh, but again, recognizing that uh, uh, our foundation with the Brits uh, wasn't, wasn't the privation that, that led uh, so many of the, of the other uh, people. Oh, and I, did, I didn't mention, uh, uh, the the second the, after American after American uh, Mexican was the next uh, highest number of states uh, with the uh, with the uh, ancestry and of course uh, if the Mexicans were still in Mexico it would, it would constitute about one fourth of the of, of Mexico so Mexico um, Mexico uh, heritage Mexican Mer 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 premiership included uh, all the states from California through Texas, including Nevada. Anyway, it's been a privilege, thanks. Uh, and I now entertain uh, any questions you might have. Thank you, George. Uh, there's a few questions. Uh, let, me, let me just, do you see the questions or should I just ask you the questions? Let me go ahead and I'll just ask the questions, uh, George. Okay. So, so um, you mentioned in Utah, uh, were there many Irish Mormon immigrants to Utah or did most, most of the Irish in Utah arrive due to the, the great Irish 
migration due to famine and poverty? Yeah, the latter. And actually, I grabbed the 1860 census, and I can actually tell you how many Irish were in Utah in 1860. Just a second. While I'm, uh, <clears throat> while I'm looking that up, I thought I had it uh, handy, but uh, basically, you know, because Ireland was Catholic, uh, the missionaries didn't really go to, go to Ireland. And uh, so I would say basically there were pretty much no Irish. Uh, I did get one number. Uh, I saw that there are only five from Spain uh, in Utah for the 1860 census. It gives you an idea of, of, of how much it was, was Northern European. Okay. This is kind of a follow up question on this, that same question, George. Is, so, and maybe you've already answered it, were the Irish accepted in Utah more than other places in the United States at that time? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, and I should have said this. Uh, the reason that the, so many of the states are German is the Germans, when they came to the US, they had money, they wanted to farm, they came because of the cheap farmland across the country. But the Irish were, were poverty stricken. And so they couldn't uh, afford to, to obtain property. So that's why the Irish just end up concentrated, you know, pretty much where they got off the boat, which is in, in, which is in uh, New England and into, and into New York. So, uh, and the same, <clears throat> the same is true about the Italians. Uh, they came late. By the time they came, the, the, you know, the, the good farmland was already gone. The, the Germans had basically picked it up. And so, again, the Italians stayed right there in that, in that uh, New York, New Jersey uh, area. So, in general, you just don't find very many people with, from Irish descent uh, in Utah. Uh, the, on the other hand, uh, or, or, or even Scotch Irish, for that matter, which is the Protestants, uh, but you, you know, you, but you see, you know, a lot of Scots. Scotland came after England as the second largest producer of, I guess, Scotland and, and Denmark after England. Great. So we've got a few more questions. Um, uh, a lot of are really like the, uh, the discussion fascinating to this Brit born to British parents at BOU. Thanks. Thanks from Provo. Uh, here's a question. Did Brigham Young cluster the British saints together? I think he clustered the Danes, for instance. There's a little bit of self clustering. Uh, you know, obviously the advantage of the, of the Brits is that they could speak English and be given assignments to, to you know, because it was a communal effort. Uh, unlike, uh, you know, coming to Oregon where I live now, uh, you could basically set your farm up by yourself. You didn't need somebody to help you, you know, build a canal and, and you know, you didn't have to take turns on, on irrigation. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we, do, we do see some of the, some of the, of the Danish, and that's the only, only one I'm familiar with. But, but they, they assimilated very well. Great, okay, here's, here's another question. Was there something cultural, cultural about England that allowed the gospel message to resonate or was it mostly economic? Uh, both. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, and I, I, just, I just found Ireland, uh, there were 278 the claim Ireland, that would be where's the combination of Northern Ireland and, and uh, Ireland proper. I would say the, the, the 278, and this is out of 40,000, uh, I'd say the 278 were probably the Scotch Irish. Uh, <clears throat> now, what was the, that question again? So oh, the yeah. question was, 
was about the gospel message to, to the British. Was, was there something cultural about England that allowed the gospel message to resonate or was it mostly economic? I would, I would say, I like to think it's, it's mostly uh, uh, cultural, which is to say, that, you know, they already had, uh, you know, competition among re religions. I think the Methodists and Baptists, uh, as well as the Church of England, uh, you still had, the, you know, Catholics. Uh, so they, some of the same things that were happening in the, in the U.S. with the uh, <clears throat> with the Great Awakening that it had already happened in England. Uh, but joining a church is, you know, it, it's a combination of things. You know, it, it's you're joining a you're joining a community. You're joining a group, and uh, so the economics came in in terms of. Uh, <clears throat> Where you, you know what, what what you wanted to do with with your religious intent. So I, so it, and there again, uh, uh, I, don't, I I'm not I'm not sure how much the the missionaries even went into the country countryside. Those are the people that were established. You know you know if they weren't family farms, they were on estates that uh, their families had, had occupied for generations, and uh, they weren't. They just weren't as inclined to, to, you know, these didn't have the motivation to, to change their life. So most would have come from like the city or uh, large populations, you think? Not from uh, agricultural type of communities in Scotland and Ireland? Uh, come again? Well, my, I guess I was just commenting on your question that um, did, did most of the immigrants come from large cities like London and Glasgow and Edinburgh or did they, were they from all, all parts of the countryside? No, now most of them, you know, Liverpool was, a, was the main jumping off point. Uh, not, no, not, not London, uh, but it would be some of the Scottish cities. They, uh, it was the, you know, the factory, the factories are up in, in Northern and Central. England, uh, but I but one thing I did read is that even though a lot of the people that came, that got to the U.S. the Utah were from the cities, uh, a lot of times they were sent out to actually you know uh, colonize uh, in you know farm towns. So they, they uh, a lot of them had to convert back to being farmers. But but the, but the, what I read said that you know they accommodated just fine. It worked out well. Right. Uh, one other question. So what options did British immigrants have once they arrived in Salt Lake City? If they lost their faith, could they, uh, could they, did many return home or did they just make Utah their home, even though maybe they were uh, disaffected from the church? Uh, I, you know, it didn't take long, especially, uh, after the railroad came in, for there to be quite a concentration of, you know, so I say Gentiles in Salt Lake City per se, and of course we still we still see that. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, some of the some of the some of the bigger employers uh, soon were uh, non-members, and of course uh, Ogden, you know, became a railroad town. And Ogden has historically had a lot of a lot of non-members, uh, so I I don't think they had that much a problem finding uh, you know a place outside the church. Did most stay? I mean, did, are there records showing people going back, or once you immigrated to the United States, you stayed? Uh, the only thing I've read about that was. Uh, uh, the Italians uh, and the Mexicans have been the ones that have been most inclined to go back. Uh, yeah, I. Even though they're even the, you know they would came to, they had they they maintained their family connections, uh, enabled to you know motivate them to, to in fact go back after they had you know accumulated some certain amount of wealth, uh, you know. Becoming a Mormon may have severed some of these family connections that, that may have uh, 
but there obviously wasn't the stigma of being a Mormon in England that there was in the United States. But uh, yeah, I in, in and, and you know, I said I'm not a historian. I haven't you know my knowledge is limited. But what I did read, uh, I didn't I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see anything about people going back. Okay. Uh, I've got one more question, George. Uh, once baptized, how quickly were immigrants temple endowed? And was there a waiting period? And then finally, was the endowment used to firm up their LDS commitment? Well, that's, yeah, that I couldn't say. I do know uh, when I got, when my wife and I were married, it was in the Manti Temple in 1963. Uh, they had placed, you know, there are only four temples outside of Utah, you know, Los Angeles, Cardston, Mesa, Arizona, and Hawaii. So, uh, they, you know, they, they built temples pretty, you know, it was, a, it was a priority pretty early in the development of Utah with St. George, Manti, and uh, I guess Logan. So I don't think there was, uh, I don't think that was necessary. I think it was encouraged. And of course, uh, that, was a, that was a major uh, motivation for the Nauvoo states to, to stick around. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that was a, a factor of, of assimilation. But I'm, but yeah, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just speculating, but but the fact that they did build temples early, uh, you know, suggests that, you know, that the priority. Okay, great. Let me see if there's any other questions. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back again to the 19, it was up until 1907, uh, if you were to be a Mormon, it was strongly encouraged that you, in, that you go to, to Utah. I guess, there, yeah, there was the Idaho Falls Temple too. Uh, but but I, think, I think that came later, now that I think about it. Uh. Right, okay. That's, that's great, George. Um, that's, that's all the questions and we're, we're close to the end. Um, any closing comments? George, we appreciate your presentation. I just, I just reiterate what was surprising to me on the, uh, the, the states that claimed uh, English as their primary ancestry, only three, and the fact that two of them were Utah and, and, and Idaho tells you uh, that you might say the democratic, the demographic implant of the Brits and the, and the Industrial Revolution into America. The Brits, the Brits didn't only go to Utah and Idaho, but they spread themselves out so much that uh, they, they weren't uh, the dominant uh, national origin like like the other ones that I that I mentioned but and my I guess one other final comment I wish I had I wish economic history had been one of my four fields at, at UCLA uh, it's certainly more interesting than, than the math econ that that I that I studied and frankly have never used yeah we can all appreciate that George uh, I know as a as a uh, my last name Palmer obviously is from England and certainly appreciate the the British influence here in the United States and and particularly my heritage too so thank you thanks everyone for for your attendance and uh, uh, George I think we talked about uh, maybe recording you on video uh, to add to this after so you can we can talk with the organizers about that uh, after this but thanks again everyone um, and uh, we'll see you in the, in the next session. Thank you all.